Okay. Welcome everybody to today's Tuesday talk at the ISS on science diplomacy for the polar regions, which will be given by Volker Rachold. Volker is the head of the German Arctic office at the Alfred Wegener Institute, the Helmholtz Center for Polar and Marine Research. And the Arctic office is located here in Potsdam and serves as information and cooperation platform between science, politics and industry. Prior to his work at the German Arctic office, he was the executive secretary at the International Arctic Science Committee, ISC, in Stockholm and Potsdam. His disciplinary background is in geochemistry, and he has been researching on land-ocean interactions in the Siberian Arctic and has been leading several German-Russian expeditions on land and on sea. Just as a quick reminder, as I mentioned, we are recording this session. And now, without uh, taking up any more time, Volker, please, the digital floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Achen, for the for the introduction, and thank you very much for the for the invitation to speak to you. Uh, I see many familiar faces, and I hope I won't disappoint you because I'm not a political scientist. I'm a geochemist, uh, and thanks for mentioning that in the introduction. So, uh, but I really like this subject of science diplomacy in the polar regions very much, and I think actually the at least the Antarctic is maybe even a model region for science diplomacy or what science can do in terms of helping diplomacy. And from that point of view, uh, I hope that, the, that, this that this talk will be interesting for you. Let me try and uh, share my screen. Uh, it worked, so it should work again. So I hope you can see my first slide, uh, which is actually a photo of the Arctic Council ministerial meeting. So uh, when I was working for IAS, I had the opportunity to, to also attend the ministerial meetings of the Arctic Council. And this here is a photo of a meeting uh, in, during the Swedish championship in Kiruna in uh, 2013. You can probably not recognize the faces because they are too small, but all the eight foreign ministers of the Arctic uh, countries are sitting around this table here together with the indigenous representatives and working groups of the Arctic Council. So the meeting was chaired by the Swedish minister uh, of foreign affairs, uh, Karl Bildt, but uh, the Russian minister Lavrov was there and uh, for the US, uh, John Kerry was also there. So quite a high level and interesting meeting. So, but before I start with the diplomacy part, just a few introductory remarks on the polar regions, which I think we have to know and have to keep in mind. <clears throat> Firstly, on the, on the geography, and there is a big difference between the Arctic and the Antarctic. As you can easily see from a geographical map, the Arctic is an ocean surrounded by land and the Antarctic is a continent surrounded by ocean. So, and that of course explains how, why these two polar regions behave so differently in terms of climate change. So why the Arctic is warming uh, two to three times faster than the world average, uh, the Antarctic is much slower in that respect. Uh, there are changes also in the Antarctic starting, but still this huge ice block in the middle of the Antarctic uh, it's like a huge refrigerator and keeps the region cold. So the things we are seeing in the Antarctic, which have mainly to do with the sea ice, which is also why the sea ice shown here, are not visible uh, like that in the Antarctic. That's one difference. The other difference, of course, or the similarity, of course, between the two regions uh, is the ice. Or let's say the water in frozen form as sea ice, ice sheets, uh, and permafrost. Uh, and that is what the two regions have, have in common. It's the ice that dominates the, the physical system in, in both polar regions. Of course, the biology is very different. You see the two uh, iconic animals, the polar bear and the penguins, of course. Uh, and as I said already, the Arctic is warming two to three times faster than the global average. The Arctic is not doing that at the moment. To start with, and I always do this when I give also presentations to kids, uh, the, the three biggest mistakes that you do when you talk about polar regions. Firstly, and that's probably obvious to everyone, there are no penguins in the Arctic. Number two, it gets a bit more difficult. Melting sea ice does not affect sea level. And that is something that you very often read even in newspapers that people confuse sea ice and ice sheets. If sea ice, which is swimming on the water, if that, if that melts, it has absolutely no effect on the sea level. That's important. And the third one, now it gets a bit more complicated, Permafrost does not melt, permafrost thaws. Permafrost, you can always keep in mind, is a frozen chicken. Frozen chicken will not melt, it will thaw. So that's what permafrost does. So the three biggest mistakes. Okay, 
but of course, the main differences between the polar regions is the political setting. So while in the, in the Arctic, and you see that on the left side, you have eight countries that form the land, that are on the land of the surrounding the Arctic Ocean. So Russia, Scandinavian countries, Norway, Finland, Sweden, uh, and Denmark via Greenland and Faroe Islands uh, and Iceland, and then Canada and the United States. So actually the, the Arctic, uh, as it is defined, normally it's defined by, by this orange border, which was uh, drawn by, by the Arctic Monitoring Assessment Pro uh, Program of the Arctic Council, um, is composed, is, is land, it's, it's uh, national territory. So except for the Arctic Ocean, the Central Arctic Ocean, which is international waters. So and that's of course a big difference compared to the Antarctic, which is kind of no man's land and governed by the Antarctic Treaty. And that explains why the two regions are so different, different in terms of governance and political settings. The other major difference, of course, is that in the Arctic, we have people. In the Arctic, we have 4 million people uh, living in the region and about 10% of this 4 million people are indigenous peoples. Uh, they are living all around the Arctic in different uh, communities, in different, different people, a different lifestyle. Uh, but that's of course something that makes the Arctic very special, the people. Whereas in the Antarctic and on the right side, you see a map of the Antarctic uh, with the Antarctic stations. There are only scientists in the Antarctic. And that's of course another big difference between the two regions. So all this human aspect is not really relevant for the, for the Antarctic. So now about science diplomacy, and I just put up the Wikipedia definition of science diplomacy. So science diplomacy is the use of scientific collaborations among nations, firstly to address common problems, and I cannot read that last word here, and, and, and the second to build constructive international partnerships. So two elements, firstly, address common problems. So how can science help to address common problems? And secondly, and that's probably very important for the polar regions is to build contract constructive international partnerships beyond science. And I think that's important that it goes beyond science. Sorry, too fast here. So I thought I'd start with a, with the a very early explorations in the Arctic and Antarctic. Um, and in the Antarctic, of course, I'd say in both polar regions, of course, this was not driven by science, it was driven by, explore, by explorers. So people who, was, who were trying to get fame and honor for their exploration, for their, for their, for their um, expeditions to the Antarctic and to the Arctic. And that is probably what was driving people into the polar regions initially. Uh, and here you see the two Antarctic expeditions, Amundsen's group on the North Pole in December, and then the poor Scott and his group just a month later, uh, discovering that Amundsen had al already reached the South Pole. But of course, there was more behind it. It was not only uh, adventure and exploring things. Of course, the background was uh, also economy. The background was, of course, uh, resources, and also in the Antarctic. And that is clearly seen from the, from the claims that several countries uh, made for, for the Antarctic, which are still there. Of course, they are, at the moment, they are, they are silent because of the Antarctic Treaty. But these claims were made already 100 years ago when uh, nations wanted to have parts of the, of the Antarctic. So, but that's science. And of course, the key, the key event for the Antarctic was the International Geophysical Year 1957-1958 which was, um, which is also partly considered one of the international polar years uh, because it was so strong in the Antarctic. Uh, but it was an international campaign of scientists, many nations were involved uh, to work together and to address scientific issues. Uh, and of course, this was only possible after uh, Stalin's death in 53. So Russia was able to, or at that time the Soviet Union was able to participate in that. Uh, and the focus was very much on earth science and many elements of earth science, so geophysical year. Uh, 67 countries participated, uh, it included the first satellite missions, 
And, and that's the most important part, the 18 months of research in the, in, in the Antarctic. And that International Geophysical Year left really an important legacy for, for the Antarctic. Firstly, of course, a scientific legacy. So it was a starting point for the Antarctic stations. So the Amundsen Scott station dates back to the geophysical year. It also made people aware that you need a better system to coordinate all the data that you get from, from research. So it was the starting point for uh, the International Council for Science and the World Data Centers. They date back to that geophysical year. And it was starting point for the Scientific Committee on Antarctic Research. Uh, so a scientific organization that includes all the countries doing Antarctic research and coordinating those kind of activities and fostering um, international Antarctic research. And then the second part was the, the political IPY legacy, IGY legacy, and that was the Antarctic Treaty. So, and that was signed in Washington, uh, December 59, uh, to ensure that in the interest of all mankind that the Antarctica shall continue forever to be used exclusively for peaceful purposes shall not become the scene or object of international discord. And that is still valid today. So the Antarctic Treaty is still valid today and will continue for many years. Um, and I think that is something which makes the Antarctic a unique, probably a unique region of the globe um, and really important. And of course, that was a starting point for a series of uh, conventions and other agreements and other mechanisms to protect the Arctic. But the core element that peaceful purposes uh, and the scientific element is already there, was already there when the, the treaty was signed in, in 59. So, and then based on that, there were many things happening over the next uh, years and decades. So many agreements and conventions. So for example, agreed measures from the conservation of Antarctic fauna and flora, uh, convention uh, for the conversation of Antarctic seals, Convention for the Conversation of uh, Antarctic Marine Living Resources, CAMELAR, which is still today extremely important because that is the forum where the countries negotiate the marine protected areas for the Antarctic region. And then probably one of the most important point also for protecting the Antarctic, the, uh, the Madrid Protocol uh, for Environmental Protection of the Antarctic, uh, to the Antarctic Treaty. So it's in addition to the Antarctic Treaty, an own protocol only for uh, environmental protection. And that includes um, that the environment shall only be, uh, shall be a fundamental consideration and that any activity related to mining resources other than scientific research is prohibited, uh, that environmental assessments are required for any activity, including tourism. Uh, that is also an important point because tourism has become really a big market for, for the polar regions and for the Antarctic, this is very carefully regulated so that any tourist activity in the, in the Antarctic has to do with environmental assessment uh, to make sure that it doesn't uh, harm the environment. Uh, the Committee for Environmental Protection is the committee that guides those kind of procedures. Um, and then all the member states areas are also prepared for emergency response. So if something happens, for example, with a tourist ship, that there is a mechanism or are mechanisms to uh, for emergency response. So uh, if you take, for example, Germany, this is uh, implemented by the, by the Umwelt Bundesamt, so the Federal, federal uh, Environmental Protection Agency, and they have very strong measures and very strong uh, requirements for people visiting, to the, visiting the Antarctic, so that any tourist activity from a German part uh, even needs to be um, approved by the Umwelt Bundesamt. So the environmental assessment is not enough. There is a, the approval for, for tourists going to the, to the Antarctic. Okay, if we look at the same in the Antarctic, of course, it was a very similar beginning. Uh, uh, it was Robert Peary who claimed that he visited the North Pole, but this is highly disputed. And probably again, it was uh, Walt Amundsen who was the first also on the North Pole uh, in uh, 1926. But the true hero, I think, for the Arctic is not Amundsen. The true hero is, at least I think in Norway, is uh, Fridtjof Nansen. Because Fridtjof Nansen was not an explorer, he was a scientist. And he uh, visited the polar regions uh, 
from a scientific perspective and he did expeditions and he did science. And just to illustrate that, I hear a short figure that I took from, from the mosaic expedition last year, which shows, shows the, the temperatures that um, Nansen recorded with his Fram expedition uh, in end of the 18th century in red and then in blue, you see the temperatures that the mosaic expedition uh, last year uh, recorded on the same day. And as you can easily see that the, the blue curves is always above the red one, which means that the temperatures over the last 120 years have substantially uh, warmed. Uh, and that is interesting to see, but it's amazing to see that Friedrich Nansen uh, 100, almost 150 years ago uh, did those kind of measurements already during his expeditions to, to the Arctic. Of course, um, the Arctic is all also about resources. And I don't want to go into detail, you know this. So there's oil and gas, and there's mining, there are oil fields, there are uh, minerals in the Arctic. And of course, the Arctic countries have an interest and a legitimate interest in, of course, uh, exploiting their resources in the Arctic. But of course, that also creates lots of problem, uh, problems. Uh, in terms of the environment and then many other things. But of course, the, the, the point is also resources in the Arctic. And if you open the news, you see this every day. Uh, the other element that is important, of course, for the Arctic is strategic interests. So just to illustrate that, here is a German occupation of Norway during Second World War. And then, of course, during the Cold War, where the Arctic, the Arctic Ocean in particular, was really the, the main area for strategic weapons uh, of the Soviet Union and also of the United States. And just showing here a submarine, nuclear submarine that, uh, that is at the North Pole um, visited by some polar bears. So, but that of course changed after the, after, the, after the Cold War. And a key moment was the speech that President Gorbachev gave in Murmansk in 1987. And I just put up some quotes from his speech because it was so important, it triggered so much. Uh, of course, it started with security, security issues. And he said that uh, he would like to invite the countries of the region to a discussion on burning security issues. Secondly, uh, he proposed consultation between the Warsaw Treaty and the NATO on restricting military activity. Thirdly, uh, he said that he, Attaches much important to the peaceful cooperation in developing the, re, uh, the resources, again, the resources. Fourthly, he mentioned the scientific exploration of the Arctic that is of immense importance. Fifthly, he said that special importance should be to the cooperation of the northern countries' in environmental protection. Uh, and the last point is, he said uh, that they would open the northern sea route for foreign ships and providing the service of icebreakers. It's interesting if you read these uh, six points and look at the um, priorities of the Russian chairmanship for the Arctic Council that will start next month, there are some things which are still there. For example, the Northern Sea Route is something which is coming up again strongly. So there is, some, there is something uh, behind that. Uh, but of course, this, this speech triggered many developments and triggered a lot in the Arctic. Uh, and I think the first thing was the Arctic Environmental Protection Strategy, also called the Finnish Initiative, which brought the eight Arctic countries together to do something in terms of protecting the Arctic and the environment of the Arctic. And one outcome was the formation of the Arctic Monitoring and Assessment Program, 1901, as the oldest, uh, let's say, political body for the Arctic or semi-political body for the Arctic, which later became one of the working groups of the Arctic Council. And then finally, the Arctic Council as the main political forum for the Arctic established in, in 1996 uh, with the Ottawa Declaration. The Arctic Council is a pretty unique body and I have to say a bit more about the Arctic Council because that's, I think, crucial. And in my view, also the best example of how science diplomacy works in the Arctic. Uh, in the Arctic. Uh, because the Arctic Council is of course driven by science and by environmental protection. Uh, it has six working groups addressing science and addressing environmental protection, but also addressing the sustainable development. Uh, 
uh, of the region. So one is the Arctic Contaminants Action Program, which is a working group to really uh, respond to uh, concrete problems, for example, uh, whatever um, cleaning of, um, of, our, of the Arctic and those kind of activities. The second one is AMAP, I already mentioned that one, uh, which monitors the Arctic, various elements of the Arctic, in particular contaminants, contaminants, but also is very important in terms of uh, developing assessments and advising the Arctic Council in terms of what to do. Uh, we have one working group, Conservation of Arctic Flora and Fauna, uh, the name says what it does. Uh, there's one on emergency prevention, preparedness and response, which for example, uh, is looking into things like oil spill, what, what to do with an oil spill, for example. There, there is one on the protection of the Arctic marine environment, pain looking into the marine environment. And the last one, uh, the one which is probably closest to the Arctic Council itself, is Sustainable Development Working Group, which helps the Arctic countries to find ways of developing their, their land, developing their countries, and developing their uh, resources in a, of course, in a way that is uh, helping the Arctic. So these are the working groups. Then of course, there are several observers, state observers and observer organizations. Uh, Germany is a state observer on the Arctic Council and we are participating in many of the activities of the Arctic Council and contributing to the Arctic Council. Um, and there are many other uh, state observers and there's a growing interest in becoming state observers. So there are many applications of states and also uh, organizations to become observer on the Arctic Council. And then finally, and that's probably the most important thing for the Arctic Council, is the participation of the uh, indigenous peoples. So they are the, called the so-called permanent participants of the Arctic Council. And these are the organizations of five indigenous groups or indigenous people uh, in the Arctic. And they have a very strong voice on the Arctic Council. They even have some kind of a veto on the Arctic Council. So they're involved in all the discussions. They are sitting in this, on the same table um, and, and they have a say on what the Arctic Council does. The other organization that was also, was also back to uh, Gorbachev's Wurman speech, and that is the scientific part that he mentioned, is the International Arctic Science Committee, which was founded in 1990. So even before the Arctic Council and the Arctic Science Committee has is different from the Arctic Council because it does not distinguish between Arctic states and non-Arctic states. So, which means that any country that is doing Arctic research can become a full member of the organization. And it's no different between, let's say, a country like Germany, which has no Arctic territory, and a country like Norway. So it's a clean scientific organization, but it's observer on the Arctic Council um, and uh, works together with the Arctic Council on a number of scientific issues, of course, in the Arctic. So some, some achievements for the Arctic, and I just want to highlight a few things, just give you a few examples of what kind of things the Arctic Council did. And I would put all of these, uh, if you go back to the de definition on science diplomacy, this diplomacy uh, using scientific cooperation to address common issues. And these are, of course, great examples of what science diplomacy can do. Um, my favorite, of course, is the Arctic Climate Impact Assessment from 2004, it's already 17 years old now. It was a joint venture of the Arctic Council and IASC. And in my view, this assessment really changed uh, people's view and people's mind uh, about the Arctic. Because for the first time, it made clear that there is some, something happening in the Arctic. The Arctic is changing at a dramatic rate, and there is something that we need to do about that. So I think, in terms of public awareness, this was probably the most important product that. The Arctic Council, together with IASC, ever came came up with, and it's still valid today. Though, of course, I mean, most of the things that were predicted in that report uh, actually became true. So the dramatic changes that they were predicting in 2004 are really seen today. Uh, then a few other examples, for example, the Arctic Council uh, Arctic Marine Shipping Assessment, uh, addressing issues of shipping. Shipping has become a really big issue in the Arctic simply because the, uh, the, the, um, the route from, from, let's say, Europe to Asia is much, much shorter if you go through the Arctic compared to the Suez Canal. 
So, and this is why shipping is, is of course a big issue for many countries, not only for the Arctic countries, uh, but of course it's connected to lots of environmental problems and environmental risks. So this is why um, this is an issue for the Arctic Council. It was done by the Payne Working Group. Um, you have the Arctic Biodiversity Assessment done by the CAF Working Group of the Arctic Council. And then the last thing I would mention is the, of course, also the IPCC, which uh, in 2019, for the first time, really looked at the polar regions and issued the, the report on the state of the ocean and cryosphere in the climate, in changing climate. Um, a very important report, I think, that also made people aware. What, one common thing in all these assessments is that they all include a scientific report. The ACR report is a 2000 page book, for example. Uh, it includes a layman or a short version for the public. And then the most important part is the recommendations for policy makers. So the outcome of these assessments directly go into to the policy makers. And of course, for the Arctic Council, that is the Arctic Council. So the eight foreign ministers of the, of the Arctic countries. Also to name a few achievements in the Arctic, uh, a few agreements. The, of course, the Arctic Council itself does not uh, take any legally binding decisions for the member countries. The Arctic Council comes up with recommendations and guidelines for the member countries. And at the end, it's uh, within the hands of the country to decide what to do with it. But the Arctic Council is also used as a forum or a platform for the, for the eight countries to develop legally binding agreements. And so far, the Arctic Council uh, developed three, or under the Arctic Council umbrella, there were three uh, legally binding agreements developed over the last years. One on uh, cooperation in aeronautical and maritime search and rescue in 2011, and there was one on the cooperation on marine oil pollution preparedness and response, 2013. And the last one was in 2017, uh, an agreement on enhancing international Arctic science cooperation. Uh, and that is a very important mechanism that the Arctic Council offers a dialogue and a forum for the eight Arctic countries to develop those kind of agreements. Another important agreement that was developed by the International Maritime Organization is the International Code for Ships Operating in Polar Waters, or so short name is the Polar Code, which, which um, provides not only guidance, but regulations for, for ships uh, navigating in polar waters. For example, uh, for the, and it's also valid for the Antarctic. For example, in the Antarctic, it was the first mechanism to, uh, to ban the use of um, of heavy oil, which produces the black carbon. This is now also uh, in place for the Arctic from 2024. So really a mechanism that makes shipping safer and uh, also better for the environment of the, polar, of the polar regions. And then the last one that I want to mention is the agreement to prevent unregulated high seas fisheries in the central Arctic Ocean. That was also initiated by the five by the five, by the five Arctic coastal states, so only those that have a coastline. Uh, but it was done together with all the big fishing nations. So the European Union, uh, the Asian countries also signed that agreement so that bans uh, fishing in the Central Arctic Ocean for the next uh, decades uh, until there is scientific research done uh, to, to make this sustainable. Okay, there are of course some new challenges that occurred over the last uh, last couple of years that makes the Arctic Council or also is, puts the Arctic Council um, or provides, let's say, challenges for the Arctic Council. So, um, for example, one thing that was in the media that probably most people saw was when Russia in 2007 put a flag on the North Pole, claiming the North Pole as their territory. According to the United Nations uh, Convention on the Law of the Sea, of course, the uh, coastal states, they can do that. There's, right, there is a, there's a paragraph in the United Nations Law of the Sea that allows this if it's justified. And there's a commission that reviews that. But of course, putting a flag is not the way it is done. And of course, that was not very well received uh, in the other Arctic countries. And then, of course, new, new players coming into the Arctic at China, when China uh, some years ago announced that they are a near Arctic state and they have interest in the Arctic, uh, of course, that created also some 
um, discomfort in the Arctic countries. Uh, uh, so another new challenge. Um, this growing interest also led to the formation of other fora and other mechanisms. And one thing that I would like to mention is the Arctic Circle, which has become the largest inter international gathering for the Arctic, which is now, I think, also but almost 10 years old, uh, with an annual assembly in Iceland and then uh, Arctic Circle fora in various countries. Now, during the corona pandemic, they, they developed an Arctic Circle virtual forum, an Arctic Circle journal. It's a very different thing compared to the Arctic Council because it brings together the, the industry, the business community, uh, the scientists, but also the political community. You see, for example, here on the one photograph is, uh, is John Kerry speaking at the Arctic Circle. Uh, and the whole thing was initiated by the former president of Iceland, uh, Olaf Grimsson, uh, who was how to say, a very powerful man in the Arctic and who has all the connections to get this thing uh, really successful. One thing I think that the Arctic Council never did uh, was discussions on security. And that was excluded from the Arctic Council mandate on purpose and from the very beginning. Um, but again, of course, the Arctic has played a key role. And on the left, you see a photo of the Reagan Gorbachev summit in in Iceland, and they met in Iceland, so the negotiations were done in Iceland in Reykjavik, uh, in this house, which is called the Hofti House. It's now it's a museum, uh, and uh, the Munich Security Conference uh, initiated a Arctic Roundtable some years ago, and they organized a meeting in this Hofti House uh, to discuss security issues in the Arctic. So, um, and. Interesting thing um, to, to, to be in that house when you sit in the same room where Gorbachev and Reagan were sitting. Uh, but this issue of security is of course growing. There's more interest in, there's more activity from, from many countries in the Arctic in terms of security. And that is something that the Arctic Council is not addressing. Uh, and that was also another thing that came up when uh, the Trump administration through uh, the State Secretary Pompeo uh, attended the Arctic Council and uh, Pompeo in his speech to the Arctic Council only talked about security and industry and business, things that the Arctic Council normally does not address. And of course that was a difficult meeting. Uh, it almost ended without a declaration. So finally Finland had some very smart diplomatic uh, ways of getting a declaration signed and getting their things into the Arctic Council so that the Council could continue. But it created, of course, problems. And that continued when Donald Trump a year later announced that he would like to buy Greenland. Um, uh, and of course, again, the security and the strategic interest is behind that, but also the, the resources in Greenland are behind that. So um, that means there are, of course, growing concerns in the Arctic, there are growing issues. Um, uh, and people ask, of course, is the Arctic Council still the right body and can the Arctic Council handle all of these things? Or is there a need for another body? There are different opin opinions on that. Some people say that the Arctic Council should uh, extend the mandate to also address those kinds of things. Others say maybe we need a separate body addressing security and strategic things for the Arctic. So, but you see that um, yeah, science diplomacy is also important in that context because, of course, all the things are somehow connected in the, in the, in the Arctic region. So just uh, at the end to, to sum up a bit. So I think the, the Antarctic is really a, a model region for science diplomacy and with the Antarctic Treaty System, which was initiated by scientific cooperation, uh, there is a mechanism in place to ban military act activity to highlight the freedom of scientific investigations and to promote international scientific cooperation. Very important, of course, is the protocol and the environmental protection. The Arctic is a bit more complicated, but at the end, if you think it through and you look at the Arctic Council and how it functions, it is also very much driven by science. So international cooperation is driven by science also in the, in the, in the Arctic. And of course, the Arctic Council is the preeminent body um, using scientific assessments for policy making uh, and also using the Arctic Council as a platform to negotiate legally binding agreements uh, 
Uh, though there are the new challenges, so the growing economic interests and the strategic, strategic interests uh, or strategic issues. So um, if the Arctic Council is able to handle all these kind of things or not, that remains to be seen. But I think at the end still, it is a really important uh, mechanism, a really important organization for the Arctic as it is the Antarctic Treaty for, for the Antarctic. So, and I think with this, I would like to end my little science diplomacy excursion and uh, looking forward to your questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Volker, for this comprehensive overview on the Arctic and the Antarctic and its current situation and recent developments. Um, as usual, if you have a question, just please raise your hand or write into the chat that you have a question. I try to not uh, overlook anybody and perhaps um, but Volker, yes, exactly. It would be good if you stop sharing your screen so we can see each other better. Yeah, I know I do that. Uh, and in the meantime, who would like to kick off the discussion with a question or a comment? Ah, okay, here we are. So, okay, then Nina, please. Yeah, thanks, Volker, for this really good overview. Um, I thought it was interesting that you mentioned the Arctic Circle, and I was just wondering, given what this has become over the past 10 years, and there's really not a lot of analysis on it, and I was just wondering what your views are on what this could, or these kinds of formats could take on, the role they could take on alongside the Arctic Council. Yeah, no, I think the, the Arctic Circle is an interesting construction, uh, and you have to see the background. And of course it is President Gripson, uh, his, 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 main, his main toy. Uh, and of course he uses his network to, uh, to extend the, the Arctic Circle and to make it more useful. But at the end, of course, it's also a company. So they, it's, it's a commercial thing. It's not like uh, the Arctic Council. So that's another issue, of course. But I think it, it has been extremely well received by people. Because the Arctic Council is, of course, something that you know, but you cannot really participate in. The Arctic Council is, of course, a closed job. Yeah? And the Arctic Circle from the very beginning was open to everyone. Yeah? Uh, and then elements that are not considered in the Council, like, like resources, like industry, like business, uh, like um, strategic things, they are all discussed in the Arctic Circle openly and freely and anyone. I, I very much like the Arctic Circle because it's the only platform that you have where you can meet scientists, industry, politicians at the same place, same place and same time in the same room. There are other models, for example, Arctic Frontiers, uh, which was the, the most important, let's say, conference for those kind of things before the Arctic Circle was there, but they had different formats. So they always separated science, industry, and politics into three parts. And when the Arctic Circle came in, nobody wanted to go to the Arctic frontiers anymore because they were all more interested in the Arctic Circle. Of course, the Arctic Council also responded. So what they did, they formed the Arctic Economic Forum, uh, which was formed by the Arctic Council. Uh, I think also in response to the, to the Arctic Circle because they were also seeing people getting more interested in this open discussions in the Arctic Circle than within the Arctic Council. And so the, I, I think my personal view is that the the initiation of the Arctic Economic Forum was a direct response to the Arctic Circle. Yeah. Thanks. I saw Barbara and then Mark. So Barbara first, please. Yes, thanks, Achim. Thanks for this really great talk um, and look into the two regions where one might think, not knowing that they are so different apart from penguins and polar bears being separated into different um, environments. Um, now, I find these two super interesting cases uh, looking into the governance regime, regimes because they are so different. Um, but now coming from what you last spoke about on the Arctic, the challenges uh, coming up and how to deal with this, I wanted to ask what kind of challenges you see for the Antarctic um, apart from we know uh, climate change impacts and fisheries, uh, questions of conservation, yes or no. 
um, is the treaty system in place sufficient uh, or sufficiently strong to deal with the various challenges and maybe also new interests in resources? What is your take on that? I, I, I would think it is. I, I haven't heard any, any from any country that there is suddenly interest in uh, exploiting the, the Antarctic. And I think that this is so stable and it has such a long history that I have the feeling that for the Antarctic, we don't really need to work. I think the Antarctic Treaty is, is very stable. And I think everybody has accepted that. And, uh, and it's, it's, it's easy because it's, it's, it's so far away and uh, there's no country which is close. Uh, the environment, of course, is even much harder to cope with compared to the Arctic. Because I mean, the central Antarctic and that will remain for hundreds, thousands of years is covered by thousands of meters of ice. And it's, we only talk about the little uh, ring around that, uh, that is open. Fisheries is sometimes an issue. And of course, when it comes to marine protected areas, uh, of course, there are countries that object you know, to setting up new uh, marine protected areas. That, that could be the only issue made that fishing interest could be, could be a problem for the Antarctic. But apart from that, I think it's, it's, we don't need to worry too much. Thanks. I have Mark and then Svenja, and after Svenja, Sebastian. But first, now Mark, please. Yes, thank you, Volker, for that great overview. Um, behind me, by the way, is not the Arctic or the Antarctic, but the third pole. It's a picture I made when I was in Nepal of the Himalayas. So your talk um, gives a nice impression, or maybe a very sad impression, of the difference and the disparity between intentions and actions. Mm -hmm. And interestingly, contrasting the Arctic and the Antarctic so closely like you did, you see a large difference in that delta between intentions and actions. The intentions for both, some, as you pointed out, historically starting off with Gorbachev and many others, uh, are very positive and um, very, very strong. Uh, let's say, common good intentions for both the Arctic and the Antarctic. But the way that that's carried out in actions seems to be much greater disparity in the Arctic than in the Antarctic. It reminds me a little bit of the comparison between the Paris Agreement and the Montreal Protocol. Mm -hmm. That um, the Paris Agreement, Stefan Schaefer and I wrote a paper two years ago in science about what we called the promises and perils of the Paris Agreement. That there's, there's great intentions and great potentials, but basically the, 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 the lack of action makes those intentions almost whitewashing, whitewashing fitting well for the Arctic. Um, whereas for the Montreal Protocol, because it was a much simpler case, because it was something that, uh, like the Antarctic, is sort of less visited, less used, it was much easier to actually turn that into action. So I'm curious if you have any, any thoughts about that, if you've ever thought of this, this comparison to the Paris Agreement and the Montreal Protocol, and if you think that there are lessons to learn on both sides about that. I, I see what you mean, of course, uh, the, but the Arctic is I, th I think that's that's one thing that for, for the Arctic countries, it's their home region. And I think for all the Arctic countries, it's a very special place. And they all uh, value the Arctic. Yeah? And they, I think for the real Arctic countries, it has a very high priority. For example, for, for Russia, and it was the same for Soviet Union, that Russia, of course, considers, uh, and Soviet Union did that, an Arctic country. And uh, their Arctic territory was always a really high priority. It's the same for Canada, for example. Uh, of course, the way this is then implemented is another story. I mean, if you take Russia, uh, the focus, of course, and it's still today, is resources and it's shipping. Uh, the indigenous peoples, for example, in Russia do not really have a high priority. In Canada, it's completely different. Uh, when the, where where the, 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 the First Nations play a really, really strong role and they, the, they own the land, so the resources that are in Canada, they, they, they belong to the First Nations. So it's a different thing. But I think it's probably, the, it's the ownership. So that the Arctic countries, I think they see the Arctic as their territory. The Paris Agreement, yeah, that's always difficult. I mean, um, it's, yeah, the whole, it's the whole globe. And, and then you hear even our German politicians say, oh, it's only 2% that what, what, we don't make a difference, right? Uh, and maybe that is the, explains why it is so. Yeah? That's my, my impression from working in the Arctic. So, and seeing how, how the Arctic states 
uh, what's the position towards their Arctic territory. But on the other hand, one important uh, interesting thing that, that sometimes co comes up in the Arctic Council, and uh, I, actually I made that point at uh, an Arctic Council meeting at one point when I said that the Arctic countries are those that feel climate change now. It's happening in their backyard, so in their Arctic territory. Why are the Arctic countries or the Arctic Council, why is the Arctic Council not having a stronger voice uh, in global climate issues? Yeah? And, and if you calculate the, the CO2 that comes from the Arctic countries, it's only 15, 20%. But if you add the CO2 that comes from the observer countries on the Arctic Council, and I did that once, you end up with 65%. So, and if you take, let's say the Arctic, the Arctic Council, including the, the observers, you would have a very, very strong voice in terms of global climate negotiations. Thanks. I have then now Svenja and then Sebastian on my list. Svenja, please. Yeah, thank you. Uh, and thank you very much for your presentation. Um, you also mentioned um, the science agreement from 2017. Um, and I was wondering what the progress and status of implementation is for that, because obviously this agreement is very important because climate change is happening so fast. So as much science as possible is needed in the Arctic, but um, I see that there are still many hurdles, um, especially when it comes to permit systems and um, visas and um, yeah, export or import um, of scientific samples. So um, yeah, I was, I was wondering if you see a fear that through the um, yeah, increasing geopolitical tensions um, that maybe the science agreement will be more applicable only to the Arctic countries and not to um, yeah, third states? I know several answers to, to your question. So the first, I think it is a really nice piece of paper, but of course it remains to be seen how it is implemented. And there is a mechanism in place uh, that uh, once per year, and the last meeting was just uh, last month and I part participated in the meeting for Germany. Uh, every, so once a year there's a meeting of experts uh, of the Arctic countries reviewing that assessment, uh, reviewing that agreement and reviewing its implementation. So that how the Arctic states, what they do in terms of implementing the agreement and, and at that meeting, um, they have to report so what they do. And then uh, they discuss the next steps. And the observer countries are of course there as observers. And, uh, and because we are, and that's the second part of your, your question. Uh, the agreement is formulated in a way, it's of course signed by the eight Arctic countries and there was no other way of signing it because it's relevant for the Arctic countries but it's formulated in a way that the non-Arctic countries are called participants. And participants means that they, uh, if they work together with the Arctic countries, they are covered by the agreement. So, which means, uh, let's say the Russian German expedition, for example, is part of the agreement. So it would benefit from the agreement. Um, the thing is that the implementation is, I would say really slow and so far, Many scientists don't even know about the agreement because it's not really well communicated. So I, for example, before the meeting, I talked to our mosaic people and asked them if there was any impact seen from the agreement in terms of the mosaic expedition and they, they didn't know very much about it and they couldn't name anything that was seen. But uh, no, and that is something that, that actually Germany, uh, the foreign office was very strong support and I asked, uh, so together we, we made the Arctic countries aware that an agreement that is only relevant for the Arctic countries would even be counterproductive because that would split the community into two classes. Yeah? And then if you at the border, you would say, okay, here's the fast track for the Arctic countries and here's the slow track for the Arctic countries. The whole thing wouldn't work at all. Yeah? Thank you. Thanks, but now Sebastian, please. Yes, thanks. Uh, and uh, Volker, excellent presentation. Thank you so much for that. I have a quick question coming back to, uh, to Antarctica and you mentioned Kamala and uh, we are following this whole discussion around the MPA proposals very closely. And this is really a prime, I mean, prime example, I think, for, for highest level um, science uh, diplomacy um, and um, having had a lot of um, sort of, so we have some... <laughs> <laughs> Some guests here as well. <laughs> Having had uh, quite a quite a um, 
sort of blockade in, in, in recent years, it seems now with, with the new US administration, there's more movement. Again, and, and just curious to hear from you how you see prospects now with getting also China and Russia on board, or do we just, you know, still um, need this confrontation and the need, you know, to, to have a consensus to, to move forward? I can't answer in detail. I, I, would, I would assume that with the new administration in the US that things will become much easier, possibly also in terms of the relationship with China, with China and Russia. But uh, I, I'm not really the expert so much on the Antarctic side. I, I, um, I would ask my colleague, uh, Stefan Hein, who's dealing with this, you know him, I guess. He would have the right answer. I, ca I cannot really answer. But I, I would assume that with the new US um, uh, administration, things would become a bit easier also in, uh, in, in Kamala, I guess. Uh, oh, thank you. Okay, thanks. We have a couple of minutes left for maybe one or two more questions. Does anyone in addition would like to come in or have another question? If not, then I would be happy to give a question or ask a question. Um, Volker, you've mentioned um, that over the past years, new fora have coming has been have been emerging, new topics like the economic forum and so on, and more players, more organizations have come into the field. Would you think that the role of science and scientists in this entire process, not particularly on the Arctic in the Arctic region, is they still important, or do you would also see that the role of science and scientists? are becoming less important because of so many new organizations, new stakeholders, new interests coming to the topic. How do you see the balance now between science and then policy diplomacy and the other topics? I, I would say it becomes even more important because I, I think the Arctic Council, and that also makes it very unique, uh, the Arctic Council, they ask for science and they, they are based on science. So uh, as of course, as I said, how the countries uh, implement uh, outcomes of Arctic Council activities like uh, assessments or recommendations is up to the to the country. But the council itself, of course, is really based on science. And I think science is, is the key. There, there are other elements that, that I didn't even mention. The one thing is, for example, the Arctic Science Ministerial process. So which was started by the US in 1996, that the science ministers of the countries doing Arctic research uh, came together in a meeting in, in Washington and then there was a second one, which we organized in Berlin in 2018, two years ago, two and a half years ago, with um, almost 30 ministers uh, from those countries doing Arctic research. And the third meeting was just last weekend uh, in, in Tokyo, organized by, by Iceland and, and Japan. Uh, and that, of course, looks at the same, in the same direction. So what kind of science do we need uh, for, for the decision uh, political decisions we take in the Arctic. Uh, and of course, it's challenging to, to link these two things because the science ministers is the Ministry of Research and Education and the Arctic Council is the Foreign, is the foreign Affairs uh, Ministries. So, uh, but then I think, for example, this agreement on science cooperation is, in my view, some kind of a link between the two because that's the mechanism to help scientists to do their science and to support the Arctic Council the decisions. So I, I would think that, and also in Arctic Circle, of course, all the discussions you have in Arctic Circle, they are at the end based on science. So, and uh, even, even let's say the, the business and the, the business sector, of course, in the Arctic relies on science. Uh, and if you, if you take, for example, take Germany, take the German guidelines for uh, Arctic policy that were published in 2019, I think science is the baseline and uh, the way decisions should be taken in the Arctic should be based on science. So, and I mean, that's of course theory, but I, I believe for, for, for the Arctic it is still somehow true. Okay, thanks. That's good to hear given that uh, the role of science has become different and there were so much questions about, let's say, for example, trust or fake science and other things, but it's good to hear that in the Arctic, this is apparently not the case. Um, having said that, we have enough time for one final question or comment, if anybody would like to. Oh, okay, then Nina, please close us off. Yeah, I just ask a really quick question following on Sebastian's question on the new US administration. And I was wondering how you expect that and the Russian chairmanship will affect the cooperation in the Arctic Council and maybe also the role of the observers in the next two years. <laughs> 
So I think that the, your new administration will just continue where the Obama administration ended. That is my impression. I think they, they just make the four years undone yeah, and reset. Yeah. I mean, the, it's already seen that John Kerry is now the climate kind of climate minister. Yeah. So, and he was, he was the chair of the Arctic Council at that time. Uh, so from that point of view, I think in, in the Arctic, um, I would expect that what the US view is, uh, just continues where Obama ended and the four years in between, they are just history and they will be hopefully forgotten soon, I guess. Yeah. The, the Russian chairmanship uh, is another thing. Uh, uh, I've seen the chairmanship program and of course it talks very much about Northern Sea Road and exploration and things like that. I think that will be a bit challenging for the Arctic Council. So uh, to find the right balance uh, between what Russia would like to do. Uh, of course, Russia is also diplomatic and smart enough uh, in the Arctic Council to continue the, in the spirit of the Arctic Council and not to change things completely. Uh, like I think the Trump administration tried um, so from that point of view, I wouldn't expect that kind of a break that you had with uh, the Trump administration. But of course, there, there will be some new challenges with the strong focus on the economy that, the Russia, that Russia brings into the championship. On the other hand, they also have science as a very, very important point in their, in their priorities. So they talk about, for example, permafrost science is really a high priority for the Russian championship. So from that point of view, I think also for science, it could be actually good. You know? so, what was the third? I forgot the third part. No, I was just wondering about the role of the observers. Ah, okay, observers. Um, I mean, in general, this tendency of more and more countries and more and more organizations applying for observer status is not an easy thing for the council. And they, they didn't clearly say that, but it was obvious that they were not too happy about having so many people sitting in the room. Uh, and so they have this mechanism that every two years they do a review of the observers. Uh, I don't know if anyone has already been kicked out. Uh, I don't know. But of course, it could happen at some point that if countries or organizations are just sitting there without contributing to the Arctic Council, that they will be kicked out. But uh, I think still this, this idea that the observers participate in the, in the working groups and in the scientific uh, activities of the working groups, or let's say with environmental expertise, I think that is something that the council will, I'm pretty, pretty sure also on the Russian chairmanship should uh, continue. And for Germany, this is good because we have a very strong Russian-German scientific cooperation in the Arctic since since 30 years. So from that point of view, it could be even positive, could be a positive thing for, for us too. Thanks. And on this positive note, we conclude today's Tuesday talk. Thank you very much, Volker, for your comprehensive presentation and all of you for the discussions. And then I would say, have a nice sunny day and see you around one way or the other. Bye. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. See you. Thanks.